This podcast will be on Chapter 9, The Nature of Knowledge. So what we're going to cover in this podcast today are the various kinds of knowledge that we can acquire. We're going to talk about encoding, um, which we've kind of already covered a little, but we'll, we'll rehash that topic. We're going to talk about how your long-term memory is organized, as well as the kind of important pieces that go along with conceptual learning, which is really, for the most part, kind of what we're after in terms of teaching. Um, we'll talk about schemas and scripts, and then we will wrap up the podcast by talking about challenging conceptual change um, or challenges within conceptual change and how we can promote conceptual change, as well as the importance of kind of helping learners to generalize their knowledge. So um, this is a nice concept map for this unit, and um, to kind of break it down for you, we've, we've talked about a lot of different forms of knowledge or memory. So you have long-term memory, and that can be broken down into declarative memory and procedural memory. And again, declarative memory is that memory for facts, data, events, whereas procedural memory is more of kind of how do I do things. We can break down declarative memory further into episodic memories, which are memories for personal experiences, and semantic memories, which are memories for more of that kind of general factual information. So in terms of declarative knowledge, again, just kind of a reminder here, we can um, divide that up into episodic memories, and those are those personal life experiences that we have. So this might be kind of an autobiographical memory, and a lot of times these memories are very emotionally charged. Um, the other big form of memory here is semantic memory, and so these are general um, facts or general knowledge you have about the world. Um, so again, these can be facts, but it also could be um, the meanings of things, so knowing what things mean, and understanding kind of more general concepts. All right, so we're back to our chart again. Um, and I would really encourage you to maybe write out your own concept map for everything within this unit as you are studying for your exam. Um, let's talk now about conditional knowledge. So, um, you know, conditional knowledge is kind of, if we look at this chart here, almost an application of um, some of these different forms of memories we've talked about. So conditional knowledge is knowing how to respond in different types of circumstances. So it's kind of taking all of the knowledge that we have, but it's knowing when and why we apply that knowledge. Um, so this is really kind of a critical piece of conceptual knowledge, which we'll talk about um, now, so conceptual knowledge is um, knowledge that is rich in relationships. It is typically made up of interconnected networks of information, and it pulls together both um, declarative and procedural forms of knowledge. Um, one of the ways that we can kind of begin to tackle conceptual knowledge is through the process of encoding. So um, encoding involves a number of different things. We can encode information based on our perception. So if we take a rose, we could encode um, a rose perceptually um, by how it smells. We can record information about a rose based on its actions. So um, in this case, maybe learning how to clip a thorny rose. Um, we can also encode information about the rose based on its symbolism. So maybe when we see a rose, it reminds us of the poem, Roses are Red, Violets are Blue. Um, and we can also encode information on, about the rose based on its meaning. So the rose is a flower. So you can encode all of these different pieces of information about the rose to really begin to form a concept of what a rose is. And the thing is, these aren't mutually exclusive, right? All of these pieces of information can help you to better understand the rose in this case. 
So what we're going to talk about now is how long-term memories can be organized. So long-term memory can be organized as a hierarchy. It can also be organized as a network. And then finally, um, we're going to talk about parallel distributed processing, which is um, maybe a little bit more complicated to understand. So we'll break that down. So in terms of long-term memory as a hierarchy, I think this is pretty straightforward, right? There are some pieces of information or some conceptual knowledge that's really made up of a hierarchy. Um, the, you know, origin of species or, or the chain of species might be one of those. So, you know, here you have uh, animals and animals can be broken down into birds or fish and then birds can be broken down further and fish can be broken down further so the the information flows um, kind of in these hierarchical categories in terms of long-term memory as a network um, this is where um, essentially all different pieces of information are kind of branched out for maybe one idea. So something like yellow, if I were to say the word yellow, that might trigger a number of different networks in your brain, basically, or in your memory. So yellow might trigger bus, which might trigger kind of a web of knowledge around school and students. Um, yellow could also trigger colors, right? And that activates all of that kind of network of memory you have. So you get the idea here. We're going to watch a video on parallel distributed processing because I think that this is one of the trickier ones. So let me play that for you now. Today, we are going to talk about parallel distributed processing, or PDP. PDP is a cognitive theory that concerns itself with connecting nodes and pathways within the brain. For example, let's say the educator teaches greetings and basic personal information in the first lesson. The nodes and pathways activated are in red. The second lesson is about asking more detailed information with the first meeting. These activations are in green. The third lesson combines introducing and personal information with arranging another meeting and saying goodbye. By practicing language and situations that connect, pathways become stronger as seen in blue. So, how can educators use this theory in the classroom? All right, so I'm going to stop that video there. Um, what I want you to notice here is that this is um, very similar to that um, network idea, right? Except with parallel distributed processing, what we're saying is that the more that certain networks are activated, um, the more built those pathways are, essentially, right? Um, and so uh, that's one of the things as educators we want to do is consistently activate those different um, networks that are going to be important for students to remember. All right, so in terms of conceptual learning, cons conceptual learning or concepts involve um, both concrete versus abstract concepts. Um, we want to help people understand a concept by giving them a positive instance or example versus a negative instance or example. And what we mean by negative instance is this is not the concept, right? So we're helping people to discriminate between um, what the concept is and what it isn't through examples. And then another thing that we need to kind of monitor with concepts is either undergeneralization of the concept or overgeneralization of the concept. So we want to make sure that students are really kind of in the sweet spot um, in terms of what that concept is and how it can be applied. So what do people learn? Well, um, usually when we are learning a concept, we're trying to understand its defining features. Um, and so these are the features that are present in all instances of applications of that concept. And then we might also want to, from there, begin to understand the correlational features. So these correlational features um, are going to be present in most you know, examples of this concept, but aren't necessarily essential to understanding the concept. And then finally, we want to understand irrelevant features so that we know when we're actually dealing with the concept or not, right? Um, so these are the important elements of conceptual learning. 
In terms of factors that can facilitate conceptual learning, um, what we know is that concepts are easier to learn when the defining features of a concept are more salient um, than, you know, maybe things that are just sort of related or unrelated at all. Um, and so that's where, again, things like concepts, concept maps can be really, really helpful um, because you're really able to see what those core features are as well as kind of where the um, features that are just sort of related or correlational lie. Um, definitions can be really helpful in an understanding conceptual learning. Um, and then again, the more um, examples and the more varied examples or positive instances we can give, the more helpful um, the kind of instruction is in um, understanding the concept. And then um, also, you know, non-examples or negative instances are incredibly helpful as well because it helps the learner to discriminate and define that concept further. Um, what we know is that these examples or negative and positive instances are going to be more effective when they're presented simultaneously, right, or relatively closely together. So it makes it just easier for the learner to discriminate. Um, and then finally, you know, really our goal should always be to align our assessment with um, conceptual learning. And so assessments should help students to monitor whether or not they really understand these concepts and have them down. So now I want to show you a video on schemas. And schemas are one way that we kind of, or a form of our conceptual knowledge. And presents psychology and the fast lane. Difficult topics explained. Schemas, assimilation, and accommodation. A schema is an organized pattern of thought that establishes a mental framework that represents some aspect of the world. We develop schemas for all types of items and activities, from simple items such as a chair, car, fish, bird, or house, to complex like the chemical bonds between atoms or the seating in the House of Representatives. In short, we develop cognitive patterns for many things. We then use the schema we have developed as a means to compare new information against. Here's an example. You have a schema for a chair, a bed, and a sofa. The first time you see a futon, you immediately search your stored schema to see if it fits with anything you have already encountered. If it comes close, you make subtle changes to your schema to include the new item. In this example, you now have a schema of a sofa that includes the traditional characteristics along with those of a futon. So when you can add new information into an existing schema with little effort, you have experienced the cognitive process known as assimilation. When you need to store new information that conflicts with the schema you already have in place, a schema overhaul is in order. The process of accommodation involves the altering of schemas as a result of new information or new experiences, and new schemas may be developed during this process. Okay, so what we see from that video is that, um, you know, we all have schemas based on our background knowledge, which we've talked about previously. And when we're learning new information, that information is either assimilated into what we already know, which means that we can maybe make just a minor tweak to the schema in, under, in order to understand this new information. Um, versus accommodating that information. So when we're engaging in the process of accommodation, we're almost engaging in a schema overhaul. So that means that the information that's coming in is so different from the schema that we had before that we can't just simply tweak it to make sense of it. We really need to maybe even develop a whole new schema in order to understand it. Um, so I know this can be slightly confusing, but hopefully, um, now that you've heard this in the podcast, it makes uh, the two concepts a little bit easier. And you've got a nice example here for um, how each of those concepts work. So now I'm going to show you an example of a script. And a script is another kind of um, piece of that conceptual knowledge. Time to wash your hands. Turn on the water. One squirt of soap. Rub hands together. Rinse hands in the water. 
All right, so you can see that a script is essentially um, a series of steps for how to um, engage in an activity, right? Or, um, yeah, kind of how you should behave in a certain activity, we could say. Um, and that is an example of um, a video model, which you might remember from earlier in the course. So in terms of the advantages of concepts, a, Concepts help us to reduce the world's complexity. Um, it allows us to um, engage in more abstraction, right? So when we really have a concept down and we've reached this higher form of knowledge, it frees up that cognitive space to do more abstract thinking about the concept. Um, concepts can enhance our power of thought and they can also facilitate inferences and generalizations to new situations. And then finally, concepts make it easier for us to make connections among things that we know. So again, if we kind of solidly understand a concept and, you know, uh, good examples and bad examples, then it's much easier for us to take new information and understand how it fits in relation to that concept. There are challenges to developing conceptual change. I like this um, little quote here in the picture, everything you look for and all that you perceive has a way of proving whatever you believe. And um, there's some truth in that. So learners' existing beliefs are going to affect their interpretations of new information. And a lot of times we call this confirmation bias. So we are constantly looking out for things that align with our concept which isn't necessarily bad, but if we maybe don't have the um, best understanding of a concept and we're constantly looking for things in the environment to confirm it, that's not all that helpful, right? For example, a friend of mine has um, this kind of conceptual belief that all women are awful drivers, right? And so when we are out driving on the road, he often um, is constantly looking for um, any female driver that might cut him off or, um, you know, not stay in her lane. Um, and what happens is he's failing to notice all of the other male drivers around him that are driving just as bad as the women are, right? Um, and so it continues to reinforce this belief for him. Um, and this kind of ties into the next idea. So learners' existing beliefs are often consistent with their everyday experiences. So you can see how this can be cyclical. If you um, have these existing beliefs, then you're going to look out for things in your environment and your everyday experiences that are consistent with that and in line with that. Um, but what we see is that sometimes erroneous beliefs can be integrated into that conceptual knowledge. Um, and it makes it kind of tough to pull those out and really challenge them because they're so interrelated to maybe other ideas we have. Um, kind of going along with this, learners might fail to see inconsistency between um, new information they receive and their prior beliefs. Um, so they might not know that they need to make an adjustment. Learners might also have um, personal or kind of emotional investment in their existing beliefs. So a good example of this um, is families who believe that vaccines cause autism, right? So no matter how much research comes out, and as a matter of fact, what we see is that the more research comes out to suggest that's not the case, the more strongly these individuals feel that vaccines really do cause their child's autism. So they find ways to dismiss that new information because they're very emotionally and personally invested in that belief. Um, and then also, you know, sometimes existing beliefs are supported by the social environment. So amongst families of kids with autism, there is a lot of, um, you know, websites and support groups and other individuals who are raising kids on the spectrum who have the same belief, right? And so it makes it that much harder to change. In terms of how we can promote conceptual change, 
Um, one of the things we know is that before we even begin instruction, teachers should try to understand what beliefs and misconceptions students might have about a topic. Um, and what we know is that rather than kind of just rote repetition with an idea or information, we need students to learn correct information in meaningful ways and in um, authentic context, right? Um, students can sometimes effectively build on maybe little kernels of truth that they have in their existing understanding. So it's also important for us to understand that as well, what kind of background knowledge students are bringing to the table. We know that students are going to be more likely to revise their current way of thinking um, if they believe there's a reason to revise their current way of thinking or there's kind of motivation there for that. And in order to do that, students have to compare their beliefs with these alternative explanations that are being presented to them. They have to want to learn the correct explanation. So um, again, to go back to that vaccine discussion, there isn't necessarily a lot of incentive for families to you know, really take in this new research and understand that their you know, existing beliefs about vaccines are wrong. Um, now, as we see diseases making their way back, like um, measles and mumps and um, all of those things, then the incentive to, you know, look further into vaccine research begins to grow. Um, and some of those beliefs maybe become a little bit more flexible. Um, but ultimately, that person has to want to learn that new, new understanding. We should also just be constantly checking for understanding and monitoring for um, misconceptions. And so to a certain degree, that is why I have you doing discussion posts, right? Because this is my opportunity to get feedback from you on whether or not you're really understanding these concepts or if there are things that seem to consistently come up where folks just are, are not quite understanding. So in terms of generalizations about knowledge, um, there can be a lot of redundancy in how information is stored, um, and that's okay, right? That's a good thing. Um, most of our knowledge is a summary of our experiences rather than information about specific events, and in most situations, integrated knowledge is going to be more useful than fragmented knowledge. So the more integrated our knowledge is, the more that we can then make generalizations and inferences like we talked about early, earlier. Um, one of the big things we know is that the in-depth study of a few topics is oftentimes going to be more beneficial to the student than a superficial study of many topics. And this is often one of the biggest criticisms of the American educational system, is that we tend to only scratch the surface of concepts or topics for students and never really get super in-depth with them. We're always on to the next unit. Um, and this is a challenge. There really has to kind of be a balance um, in instruction. Um, but this is why we have things like dissertations for students who are in, you know, pursuing advanced degrees because theses and dissertations help that student to gain in-depth knowledge on a topic so that then they can, um, you know, kind of have this area of expertise where um, as new information comes in, they can evaluate it in the context of all of this in-depth knowledge they've gained. And that's it for today's podcast. You can do your discussion post.